Welcome to the Trump Breaking News Network, your daily source for up to the minute Trump news. Join us today and every day. Here's today's news. This is TBNN. How Trump Averted World War III by the Anonymous Patriots. Now that World War III was averted, global factions are colliding. We have just avoided World War III, not because of the Astana Syrian peace talks but because Trump has broken the back of the New World Order's attempt to enthrone the Bush oil cartel in its global CIA headquarters in Ashtana, Kazakhstan. Now, we the people need to do one more thing to make sure our elected officials know that we are not going to live in the swamp they created. But first let's check out a swamp that is beginning to stink in Kazakhstan. If you have never heard of Ashtana, then it is time to learn what the legacy media is keeping from you. For those of you who follow the anonymous Patriots Citizens Intelligence Reports, you will be familiar with the high-level intelligence we provide fellow Patriots so that you are armed with the truth that the legacy media can't tell you because they are the opposition. Whether CNN, NBC, or Fox, they operate as weapons of deceit to keep we the people from knowing the deep truth about our world and its rulers. If we are to support the new administration in wiping out the world's common enemy, we need to know WHO the enemy is and what their battle plan looks like. We also need to know the deep crimes they have committed against humanity. Astana, appropriately, its anagram is a Satan, is a legacy of George H. W. Bush Sr. and Dick Cheney's illegal manipulation of the oil reserves in the former countries of the USSR that now are ruled by despots and kleptocrats funded through oil cartels. Also in Astana is a battle being waged between Pope Francis and Kazakhstan's president, Nursultan Nazarbayev for a one-world religion, or global theocracy. Nazarbayev wants to use the Congress of World and Traditional Religions to establish his global control of religion in Astana. The Pope, however, has a different idea. In a remote place in Kazakhstan, all the nefarious global factions are colliding, the CIA, Bush, Cheney. The oil cartels, the Vatican and Pope, the United Nations, the banksters, and the dirty secrets of 911. To understand what is unfolding there today and how actions of the Trump administration have averted World War III, you need to learn the history that the legacy media has not told you. Unfortunately, the average U.S. citizen is clueless because for decades our corrupt government has failed to prosecute the domestic terrorists that still walk freely among us and our media has kept the citizenry in ignorance. In this lengthy, but highly valuable, Citizens Intelligence Report, you will learn why Trump's victory dashed the hopes of both the new rogue CIA headquarters in Astana and the plans of the new gray Pope Francis to take over the world's religions. The Bush oil cartel's role in the fleecing of oil and gold from Kazakhstan and Azerbaijan. How Kazakhstan's President Nazarbayev became one of the richest men in the world and why he has been chosen to develop the global anti-terrorism plan of the United Nations. How George Bush Sr. developed a rogue CIA that morphed into private intelligence agencies that control oil and gold interests throughout the world. How Kazakhstan's International Financial Center is the CIA's newest crooked banking complex for hiding its fraudulent activities in Eurasia. Why Kazakhstan has been chosen as the new home of the United Nations efforts for a one-world religion. The battle between Pope Francis and President Nazarbayev over who will rule the new one-world religion, a theocracy which is a cross between the socialistic liberation theology of Pope Francis and the dictatorship of President Nazarbayev. Nazarbayev the kleptocrat. On September 29, 2006, President Bush hosted the President Nursultan Nazarbayev of Kazakhstan at the White House. The State Department firmly opposed the visit, as did staffers at the National Security Council. But Nazarbayev had a closely guarded relationship with the power behind the throne in Washington Vice President Dick Cheney. During the Clinton years, Cheney served as CEO of Halliburton a leading oil and gas industry service provider with an enormous position in Kazakhstan. Chandy also served Nazarbayev as a member of Kazakhstan's oil advisory board. The relationship continued when Chaney came to the White House with Bush Jr., and Nazarbayev sought Chaney's advice and intervention in connection with a Justice Department corruption investigation. 
There was lingering suspicion in Congress that Cheney intervened to slow down the Justice Department's management of the Kazakh corruption investigation which eventually slowed to a stop. Key point, Nazarbayev and members of his immediate family have accumulated some of the largest private fortunes in the world in oil, gas, telecommunications, hospitality, construction materials, banking and finance. Nazarbayev is one of the wealthiest men in the world. Kazakhstan, for all its economic accomplishment, is anything but a burgeoning democracy. Nazarbayev secured passage of a bill allowing him to run for as many presidential terms as he likes. His intelligence service frequently finds cause to harass and intimidate the opposition. In recent elections, opposition parties have won one seat in parliament. Western observers like the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe OSCE, have accused Nazarbayev of rigging elections. The Kazakhgate trial in the U.S. demonstrated that the Justice Department believed there was a pervasive culture of corruption within Nazarbayev's regime. James Giffen, an American businessman with ties to Western oil companies, was accused of funneling millions of dollars in bribes to Kazakh officials. Giffen ran Mercator Corporation, a small New York merchant bank. Mercator's business consisted of representing and advising the government of Kazakhstan in negotiating oil and natural gas concessions with Western energy companies. In the beginning of 1995, at the same time as Mercator won the Kazakhstan contract, Giffen was made a counselor to the president of Kazakhstan, a title which gave him special privileges in dealing on behalf of the Kazakh government as well as foreign energy companies. The idea was that for each successful transaction completed, Kazakhstan would pay Mercator a certain fee. In fact, this fee was paid by the energy company as a part of a deal it struck with the Kazakh government. This money went into escrow accounts at several Swiss banks. According to the indictment, Giffen illegally diverted some of the escrow money into secret Swiss bank accounts, moreover, he used more than $78 million of these funds to make payments to high-ranking Kazakh officials, including Prime Minister Baljimbev and President Nazarbayev. Kazakhstan paid Mercator more than $60 million between 1995 and 1999. Giffen had some links to the CIA that ordered or sponsored his dealings to strengthen U.S. relations with oil-rich Kazakhstan. Giffen was part of a White House effort to cozy up to an oil-rich nation's kleptocratic leaders via highly illegal means. Bush Oil Cartel in Central Asia Prior to the attack on the World Trade Center, there were a number of seemingly independent, U.S. covert operations occurring in many Central Asian countries, but primarily, Afghanistan, Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, and Uzbekistan. The central figures in these theaters of operations were Richard Cheney, Richard Secord, Richard Armitage, George Bush Sr., David Kimchi, Mossad Intelligence, Adnan Khashoggi, Saudi Intelligence, and Farhad Anzama. The central institutions in these operations were Halliburton, Unical, Delta Oil, Enron, Union Bank of Switzerland, UBS, Credit Suisse, the Bank of New York, and the Deutsche Bank. For our intelligence report on 9-11 that explains these players and events in more detail, see, who did 9-11 and why did they do it? The first Bush administration, under the guidance of Zbigniew Brzezinski and Henry Kissinger, formulated and initiated a strategy to control Central Asian oil. U.S. covert activities in the region were guided by that strategy. Prior to his departure from office of the presidency, Bush put into motion a number of covert activities that would ensure the continuation of his strategy. Those activities would include sending his former Iran-Contra operatives, Richard Secord, Richard Armitage and Farhad Azama, into Azerbaijan, and James Giffen into Kazakhstan. The Taliban government in Afghanistan had reneged on a deal with Unical, U.S., and Delta Oil, Saudi, in August of 2001 to allow Unical and Delta to build and control a pipeline from the Caspian Basin through Afghanistan. The Bush administration was heavily populated by former energy sector professionals, Bush Harkin Energy, etc., Cheney Halliburton, Condoleezza Rice Chevron, Tom White Enron, to list a few. Along with the energy lobby representing the single greatest source of Bush campaign contributions, these bad actors planned, 
executed and covered up the attack on the WTC to justify a war with the Taliban government, and a subsequent invasion of Iraq. The North Tower of the WTC housed the offices of the FBI where investigations into two seemingly independent crimes were ongoing, illegal gold trades in Kazakhstan Gate, specifically the illegal payment of bribes to Kazakhstan officials by mobile oil representatives Giffen and Williams. The money laundering involved in both cases crossed paths through the Deutsche Bank and Credit Suisse. Because the secret services of Kazakhstan and Azerbaijan were working together, in unison with Richard Secord and David Kimchi, Mossad, any investigation into Kazakhstan bank accounts probably would have carried over into Azerbaijani bank activity. Together, these seemingly unrelated events demonstrated a larger pattern of investigation into the German banking cartel by U.S. investigators. Five incidents, listed below, were being investigated in the offices in the WTC at the time of 911. Collectively they suggest that consecutive U.S. administrations had sought to further the interests of the U.S. and Saudi oil companies in Central Asia and Russia, and had undertaken covert operations to do so. 1. The James Giffen, Bryan and the Credit Suisse scandal involving Mobile Oil, Philips Oil, Chevron and Halliburton in Kazakhstan, which while reported as isolated to the Union Bank of Switzerland, UBS seems to avoid reporting involvement of Mark Rich, Russian Mafia, Israeli, and his use of the Bank of New York, Cayman Islands, Deutsche Bank chain for his money laundering and oil swap operations. 2. The mega oil operations in Azerbaijan, involving the former Iran-Contra guns for drugs operatives and their UBS accounts. 3. Enron and Unical operations in Afghanistan and Pakistan using Deutsche Bank channels to funnel money through the Pakistanis to the Afghanis. 4. The Kevin Ingram scandal in which this Deutsche Bank executive was convicted of laundering money for weapons purchases for Muslim terrorists through Pakistani agents, and 5. The Bank of New York Russian money laundering scandal, in which Russian funds were being sent back to Russia via the Cayman Islands, where they were being picked up by the Deutsche Bank and Bankers Trust. Caspian Oil before the Central Asian money laundering activities can be explained, the Afghan pipeline, and the lesser discussed BTC, Bakut Blizai Sahin, pipeline from Azerbaijan through Turkey, need to be understood with some geographical context. At one time, the Caspian Sea Basin was considered to be the fourth largest oil reserve in the world. Three of the four largest oil fields in the Caspian Basin are located in Kazakhstan. The fourth field is located in Azerbaijan. The region also includes the world's fourth largest natural gas reserves in Turkmenistan. Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, and Turkmenistan are landlocked, thus requiring pipelines to export the reserves to market. The current pipelines out of the Caspian move oil north, through Russia. An alternative pipeline was planned to the south, through Iran. Having Caspian oil and gas flow through either Russia or Iran was not a situation that the U.S. and Saudi oil companies wished to have happen. Nor was Russia willing to allow U.S.-owned oil to flow through its pipeline. The only options available to the U.S. and Saudi oil firms were controlling the Afghanistan and or the BTC pipeline through Turkey. The Russians were investing in surrogate military forces which they hoped would control the political situations in Azerbaijan and Afghanistan to a point that U.S. and Saudi interests and partners were prevented from controlling the oil and gas. In the meantime, the U.S. and Saudis were investing in surrogate forces in Dagestan, Chechnya and Azerbaijan to help counter Russian forces. The Chechnyan conflict was always about controlling the pipeline. Generally ignored in the economic overview of Caspian oil, is a discussion of the vast gold wealth, as well as opium and heroin, found in this region. Long before oil became a global battleground, gold and heroin trafficking had attracted the Russian, Israeli mafia. Kazakhstan is reported to hold 20% of the world's gold reserves. The Caspian Basin was Russian mafia turf before the oil companies appeared on the scene, and payoffs to the Russian. Israeli mafia were absolutely critical. While U.S. and Saudi oil companies were buying access to Caspian oil, many other Western companies were being forced out of the region. 
two companies managed to establish a rapprochement with the mafia. One of them was Barrick Gold where George Bush Sr. was a board member. Barrick leveraged for itself a significant position in Kazakhstan. Barrick was a major CIA gold laundering operation used to launder thousands of tons of gold stolen from various treasuries, including those of the former Soviet Union. Barrick and its partner in Kazakhstan, Nelson Gold, were run by Nazarbayev's son-in-law. Nazarbayev was extensively involved in money laundering and illegal oil deals. Azerbaijan dealings reveal the domestic enemies of the U.S. In Azerbaijan, one finds a large cast of participants all linked through supporting roles in the Iran-Contra scandal, the October surprise, and Bush and Cheney's private intelligence agencies Far West, Diligence, and Halliburton. In Azerbaijan, these Bush rogue CIA individuals are Dick Cheney, as CEO of Halliburton lobbyist for the Azerbaijan International Operating Company, on U.S. Azerbaijani Chamber of Commerce. Adnan Khashoggi, whose Azerbaijan banks played a big part in the formation of terrorist camps and in the opening of laboratories for developing chemical and bacteriological weapons in Nagorno-Karabakh. Richard Secord, a former U.S. Air Force Major General who had been helping to recruit and train the Azerbaijani Army as well as regional secret services. Richard Armitage, acting as a consultant to Halliburton and Unical at the time, and president of the U.S. Azerbaijani Chamber of Commerce. Farhad Azama, arms merchant with Iranian background, member of U.S. Azerbaijani Chamber of Commerce, assisted Richard Secord in recruiting and training Mujahideen mercenaries, owns the Azerbaijan Airlines, and has a 20-year-old relationship with the Bush family enterprise. Khalid bin Mahfouz, owner with the Bin Laden family and members of the Saudi royal family of the Saudi companies Delta Oil and Nimr Oil. Both are partners with Unical in Azerbaijan. David Kimchi, Israeli Mossad agent who brought Israeli agents into Azerbaijan at the request of Secord, and worked with Secord and the regional secret service organizations. The essence of the Azerbaijan operation was an effort by former Iran-Contra conspirators to illegally support the despotic government of Azerbaijan in its war against Russian-backed Armenia. In doing so, they supposedly sought to protect for U.S. and Saudi oil interests a western access to the Caspian oil basin, and one of the four largest oil fields in the region. They did so by illegally recruiting Afghan Mujahideen mercenaries to fight for Azerbaijan against Russian-backed Armenians, using mega oil as the financial cover. Richard Secord also brought the Mossad into Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, and Uzbekistan. It is clear that Azerbaijan is merely a base operation for the broader Central Asian operation initiated by Bush Sr. in 1991. The key player in the operation to control Azerbaijan politics was Secord and mega oil. Secord has a long history which intertwines with the Bush Family Trust, Harkin Energy, George Bush Jr.'s insider trading scandal and pump and dump scheme, UBS and the BCCI group of Saudi investors. The Azerbaijani mega oil operation had the same cast of illegal money launderers associated with the Barrick gold laundering, the BCCI Saudis and Adnan Khashoggi, the Bush Enterprise, and illegal weapons merchants. As with the Giffen, William's scandal in Kazakhstan, this operation began under George Bush Sr.'s White House sponsorship. The connection is fairly explicit, with Giffen being responsible for a meeting between Nazarbayev and George Bush Sr. in May of 1992. In addition to covert White House sponsorship, significant lobbying assistance was provided by the United States Azerbaijan Chamber of Commerce, USAC. It was this body that has, and remains, the source of negotiations, planning and structure in the region. Prior to many of its board members entering the Bush Jr. Y, they were the force behind the U.S. congressional effort called the Silk Road Strategy of 1996-1998, the Caspian Initiative, Black Sea Pipeline Routes and the Division of the Caspian Sea. The USAC advisory board consisted of these men, Dr. Henry Kissinger, James A. Baker III, Lloyd Benson, Zibinu Brzezinski, Dick Cheney, Brent Scowcroft, John Sununu, James A. Baker IV, Don Stacy, Amico, and Richard Armitage. 
From the point of view of this group, the Grander Silk Road strategy was one of capturing the Caspian oil. Bush tried to outflank Iran and not allow oil and gas pipelines to run through Iran from the northern Caspian region, Russia, Caspian Sea, and Turkmenistan slash Kazakhstan, south to the Persian Gulf and into Pakistan. Bush, inextricably tied to Western oil interests, wanted to run pipelines through Afghanistan into Pakistan as the counterweight on the Eastern Front. The pipelines through Iraq, and Iraq controlled by the U.S., is the counterweight on the Western Front. Russia wanted the Black Sea routes, China the Silk Road routes, Bush wanted everything to flow south from the entire region into his deep pockets via the Persian Gulf routes. Dick Cheney's Kazakhstan Gate The Tengiz oil field on Kazakhstan's Caspian coast is one of the ten largest oil deposits in the world, and was first developed in 1993 in a joint venture headed by Chevron which owns 50% of the consortium. The resulting enterprise, Tengizchev Royal, was later joined by Mobil as a 25% owner. The government of Kazakhstan owns another 20%, and Russian-American joint venture Luke Oil holds a 5% share. U.S. oil company control of the Tengiz oil field, 75%, is largely attributable to James Giffen and Brian Williams of Mobil Oil, and Dick Cheney of Halliburton. Condoleezza Rice was on the board of directors of Chevron and was its main expert on Kazakhstan. During the course of acquiring rights to this oil field, it appears that Giffen and Williams acted illegally in the manner in which they won these contracts. It appears that Dick Cheney, as CEO of Halliburton, may have also been involved in illegal activity in Kazakhstan. Government prosecutors attempted to gloss over the involvement of George Bush Sr. in the Giffen. Williams' investigation by limiting the period of activity in the indictment. The relationship to the Bush Sr. White House should not be viewed as coincidental. Mega Oil, with its ties to the Bush family and Saudis, also initiated its covert activities on the opposite side of the Caspian, in Azerbaijan, in 1992 under George Bush Sr. James Giffen and Brian Williams of Mobile Oil made illegal payments to Kazakhstan officials. President Nazarbayev in particular, on behalf of Mobile Oil. Millions were impounded at Bank Pictet and other Swiss money centers representing illegal payoffs to Kazakh officials by three major U.S. oil companies, Mobile, BP Amico, and Philips Petroleum. Giffen's alleged role was that of the go-between who secretly transferred these huge bribes from the U.S. oil corporations along circuitous international money laundering routes to Kazakhstan's president and his job aides. Giffen and Williams were found guilty in 2003 of money laundering. Dick Cheney was extensively involved in at least two of the four areas of the Kazakhstan investigation, the Caspian Pipeline Consortium and the Tengiz oil field contracts. As the CEO of Halliburton, his company was a direct beneficiary of the construction of the pipeline. As a member of Kazakhstan's oil advisory board, with Giffen, he helped broker the Chevron oil deal for the Tengiz oil fields. Just as Giffen and Williams cheated their partner, Farhad Tambo, so did Cheney cheat his original partner Scott Van Dyke of Anglo-Dutch Tengay, an oil company. As part of his efforts to get Chevron into Kazakhstan, Cheney breached his confidentiality agreement, for which Halliburton was later found guilty and paid a $70 million fine. At a superficial level. The FBI was able to prosecute two American business executives for violating the law with an oil swamp between Iran and Kazakhstan. Dick Cheney's role in this particular set of crimes, and his efforts to have Nazarbayev exempted from prosecution remain unreported in the legacy media. There is, however, at least one other set of activities that Cheney was most probably involved in which were unreported oil swaps between Kazakhstan and Angola with a significant shipment of Russian weapons. Halliburton was involved in illegal oil swaps with Angola. First, Halliburton, again, under Cheney, apparently was involved in bribery in that region of Africa, with enough evidence for the Department of Justice to open an investigation involving the payment of $180 million in possible kickbacks to obtain contracts to build a natural gas plant in Nigeria during a period in the late 1990s when Vice President Dick Cheney was chairman of the company. 
Halliburton and the oil companies in Kazakhstan are the same companies that benefited from major contracts from questionable activities in Angola, using the same financial conduits used by Giffen and Williams and the U.S. oil companies in Kazakhstan. Nazarbayev, the Russian, Israeli Mafia and Angola Gate U.S. oil companies in Kazakhstan were in need of moving oil out of Kazakhstan because its oil's pipeline was not finished. Yet, the Russians were not allowing oil to be moved through Russia, and U.S. law prohibited moving it through Iran. The individuals arranging swaps to move oil out of the country ran a large number of swaps, but the swap with Iran drew the most attention because of the illegality of trading with Iran. These same businessmen were running oil deals between Angola and Russia. Like Iran, Angola had its own maritime access. So a swap between Kazakhstan and Angola would serve the same purpose as a swap between Iran and Kazakhstan, except the Angola swap would not violate the law. The Mark Rich, Glencore, connection is insightful because it identifies the probable link between the Russian, Israeli mafia and the oil swap industry and the structure of its money laundering methods. These methods demonstrate involvement by the Deutsche Bank. During the U.S. Justice Department 1998-1999 investigation of the Bank of New York's money laundering on behalf of the Russian Mafia, Mark Rich was implicated. Mark Rich's Glencore was involved in laundering Russian Mafia money through the Bank of New York. According to Australian sources, the money was moved from the Bank of New York to the Pacific Island country of Nauru. What is interesting is the revelation that at the same time the Bank of New York was required to shut down relations with Nauru as a result of the investigation so were the relationships of Nora with Deutsche Bank and Bankers Trust. The simultaneous cessation of relations of these banks with Nora suggests these banks were part of the same money laundering investigation, and conduits used by Mark Rich, on behalf of the Angola Gate Gang and the Russian Mafia. The U.S. Export-Import Bank funding was used to buy weapons and towards the end of its journey, was put in the Bank Rossiski, third-largest bank in Russia, where Gatamak was a director. Bank Rossiski was later documented to be a part of the Riggs Vomit Banking Network, run by Jonathan Bush, brother of George Bush Sr. The money was then loaned to Russian and Angolan officials using securities as collateral. The collateral turned out to be worthless and the bank nearly went bankrupt. Lending credibility to the claim that there was most likely a link between Angola Gate and Kazakhstan Gate, reports indicate that the bribes to Kazakhstan officials involved three of the same banks as the Angola Gate money laundering operation, Bank of New York, Bankers Trust, Deutsche Bank, and Credit Agricole Indosuez. Credit Agricole Indosuez was a correspondent bank with Bankers Trust in New York City and was operated using the assets of the closed BCCI bank. Russia got the oil. Angola got the weapons. The whereabouts of about a half million dollars is known, and the rest, about $1.4 billion, disappeared. In a bizarre twist of fate, the Angolan debt to Russia was transferred to the U.S. taxpayers under the guise of loans. Compliments of Halliburton and Cheney. Somewhere in between, brutal dictators and corrupt businessmen we got bonuses. Astana, home of the rogue Bush CIA. Now that you have the backstory on Kazakhstan, perhaps you can understand the reason for the UN's involvement with the Astana, a fully built, but people empty, town awaiting the promised arrival of the United Nations Congress of World and Traditional Religions, the Astana International Financial Center and Future Energy Expo 2017. It stands ready to house the United Nations and all of its agencies. Key point, Trump has ended President Nazarbayev's dreams to become the home of the new world order that George Bush Sr. preached and planned for so fervently. Astana is the Bush oil cartels, rogue Bush CIA, beautiful new home equipped with a palace of peace that is focused on creating a new global theocracy with Kazakhstan's corrupt president, Nursultan Nazarbayev leading the UN-sponsored movement. All of these bad actors were just waiting for their gal Hillary Clinton to become president so they could collapse it all and roll up the world in a new world order, headquarters located in Astana. As you have now learned, Bush Sr. and Dick Cheney fleece the oil and gold from Kazakhstan and Azerbaijan.
all the while making these countries home to the rogue CIA's activities. The presidents of Kazakhstan and Azerbaijan stole billions from their countries and built spectacular capital cities that have both become home to the New World Order, a goal of the United Nations to have geographical and cultural places of its own. For more detail on the factions of the CIA, see our article on CIA Swamp Monsters. Astana spared no expense in its bid for global domination. It has lured UN operations by constructing spectacular buildings that are waiting to be filled. It has created a new Switzerland which is projected to become the largest tax haven in the world. New laws have been written to draw investors to Astana. Additionally, a new stock market for Asia is in the works which will be located in Astana. There is also the rumor that when Pope Francis comes to the Congress of Religions this year in 2017 that he will take leadership of the One World Religion Movement. President Nazarbayev and the rogue Bush CIA seek to unite Geneva, Rome, and the City of London into the new global home of the United Nations in Astana. Nazarbayev has already been given the mandate by the UN to create, through the Congress of World and Traditional Religions to create a global policy on anti-terrorism. He is now in direct competition with Pope Francis for the position of world leader of the One World Religion. At one time, it was the plan that Francis would go to Astana to lead this Congress, but his plans have now changed and he wants to keep control in Rome. Key point, Trump's victory, and his suggestions of defunding and or exiting the UN, has destroyed the globalist plans of uniting the three ruling cities of Geneva. Rome and the city of London into a ruling capital for the New World Order. How is Pope Francis involved? Let's not forget the Pope and this globalist agenda and takeover of the world. Keep in mind that Francis is a socialist liberation theologist, essentially a socialist who believes in open borders and political activism. He is also a Jesuit apocalyptic theologian who believes the end times are upon us. Francis recently completed his takeover of the Roman Catholic Church by placing an exact copy of himself from South America, his lieutenant, as the head of the Jesuits, a position called, the Black Pope. The anonymous patriots warned of this move in an intelligence report in April 2016 entitled Countdown to Armageddon where we outlined how Pope Francis would make a play to take over the Jesuits once the Black Pope Adolfo Nicholas retired. Perhaps rebel factions in the Vatican hadn't considered what Francis was planning to do, or had the capability of doing, until they read this article. Once exposed, Francis had to figure out another way to usurp the position of the Black Pope. So instead of directly absorbing the Jesuits under his control, he put one of his minions in the position of the Black Pope. For all intents and purposes, Francis now controls the Jesuit order and the Knights of Malta. To make the overthrow complete, Francis recently forced the resignation of the head of the Knights of Malta, the economic insider trading club that controls the richest group of elites in the world. Pope Francis is now the Grey Pope, having merged the two Vatican factions, black and white, under his total control. As we reported in Countdown to Armageddon, Francis was hoping for World War III which would create a crisis providing an opportunity to install the King of Jerusalem. Juan Carlos of Spain, in the holy city of Jerusalem and declare the coming of the end times, the Battle of Armageddon being acted out in Syria. Their Jesuit Messiah, none other than Juan Carlos of Spain or his heir Felipe V, would return and Pope Francis would usher in a new age of worldwide socialism. Essentially, this would create the opportunity for the Jesuit apocalyptic return of the Messiah who would become a temporal king of the world. This would create a global theocracy. Nazarbayev also wants a global theocracy, but he believes he is the new world leader that will make this one world religion happen in Astana through the Congress of World and Traditional Religions. He has even built a palace of peace to house this new one world religion, global theocracy. Kazakhstan is offered as a model of religious and cultural harmony for the world to emulate. Delegates to the Congress repeatedly condemned violence in the name of religion with Nazarbayev saying that attempts to use Islam to justify extremism and terrorism are blasphemous, and said any religion is great if it supports peace and unity. Nazarbayev offered Kazakhstan as an example of perfect cooperation and harmony between religions to the delegations of the Congress.
We have shown the world that the fatal inevitability of conflicts of religions and cultures does not exist in our society, and they can be avoided at any level of international politics. We have demonstrated that tolerant attitudes within society are the question of conscious responsibility of the state, religious organizations, and ordinary citizens. The Congress of Leaders of World and Traditional Religions, we view through the prism of global recognition of the success of our experience in Kazakhstan. Astana to be the new Switzerland. Folks, one of the richest men in the world and certainly a very well-connected man, Nazarbayev, has stated that he wished to join with Iran in creating a single currency for all Central Asian states. In 1994. Nazarbayev suggested the idea of creating a Eurasian Union during a speech at Moscow State University. In 2014, Russia, Belarus, and Kazakhstan signed a treaty to create a Eurasian Economic Union which created a single economic space of 170 million people. In 2015, Nazarbayev signed the Constitutional Law on the Astana International Financial Center AIFC. The law supports the establishment of the new financial center, which aims to turn Astana into a regional financial hub by creating favorable and attractive conditions for investment and finance. Members of the AFC will be exempt from corporate income tax, property and land taxes until 2066. The AFC will follow English law and principles and the standards of the world's leading financial centers. The center will have its own legal system in certain areas governing inter alia, civil law relations with and between participants of the center, the formation, governance and registration of companies, financial services, employment relations, to name a few, provide a system separate from national law. The operating language in the courts, and in the administration of the center itself, will be English. Regarding capital market developments. Large national companies such as oil and gas, railway, electricity and postal companies will be privatized, all based on the new stock exchange. There are clear plans to create a private investment climate and more private banking opportunities. Among the main goals are for the AFC to become the center of Islamic finance and green financial industries. Sound like the new Switzerland to you? Not so idyllic Kazakhstan. But the reality of Kazakhstan is evidenced in this World Justice Project's estimation. Kazakhstan's global rank in the World Justice Project's 2015 Rule of Law Index was 65 out of 102, the country scored well on order and security, global rank 32 102, and poorly on constraints on government powers, global rank 93 102, open government, 85 102, and fundamental rights. 84-102, with a downward trend marking a deterioration in conditions. Kazakhstan's human rights situation under Nazarbayev is uniformly described as poor by independent observers. Human Rights Watch says that Kazakhstan heavily restricts freedom of assembly, speech, and religion. In 2014, authorities closed newspapers, jailed or fined dozens of people after peaceful but unsanctioned protests and fined or detained worshippers for practicing religion outside state controls. Government critics, including opposition leader Vladimir Kozlov, remained in detention after unfair trials. In 2014, Kazakhstan adopted new criminal, criminal executive, criminal procedural, and administrative codes, and a new law on trade unions, which contain articles restricting fundamental freedoms and are incompatible with international standards. Torture remains common in places of detention. Kazakhstan is ranked 161 out of 180 countries on the World Press Freedom Index, compiled by Reporters Without Borders. As of 2015, Kazakhstan has never held an election meeting international standards. Nazarbayev espoused anti-religious views during the Soviet era of his reign. He has now made an effort to highlight his Muslim heritage by performing the Hajj pilgrimage and supporting mosque renovations. However, in 2012 Nazarbayev proposed reforms, which were later enacted by the parliament, imposing stringent restrictions on religious practices. Religious groups were required to re-register, or face closure. The initiative was explained as an attempt to combat extremism. However, under the new law many minority religious groups are deemed illegal. 
outright corruption. Over the course of Nazarbayev's presidency, there have been an increasing number of accusations of corruption and favoritism directed against Nazarbayev and his circle. Critics say that the country's government has come to resemble a clan system. According to The New Yorker, in 1999 Swiss banking officials discovered $85 million in an account apparently belonging to Nazarbayev, the money, intended for the Kazakh treasury, had in part been transferred through accounts linked to James Giffen. Subsequently, Nazarbayev successfully pushed for a parliamentary bill granting him legal immunity, as well as another designed to legalize money laundering. When Kazakh opposition newspaper Respublika reported in 2002 that Nazarbayev had in the mid-1990s secretly stashed away $1 billion of state oil revenue in Swiss bank accounts, the decapitated carcass of a dog was left outside the newspaper's offices, with a warning reading there won't be a next time, the dog's head later turned up outside editor Irina Petrushova's apartment, with a warning reading there will be no last time. The newspaper was firebombed as well. Tenets of the Congress of World and Traditional Religions President Nazarbayev created and hosts the Congress of World and Traditional Religions in Kazakhstan every few years. The next Congress is planned for spring of 2017. The tenets below clearly show that the United Nations is thoroughly backing Nazarbayev in every way possible. The UN trusts Nazarbayev's leadership so much that they have exclusively assigned him the task of creating a counter-terrorism plan for the entire world. This is quite odd seeing the huge discrepancies in Nazarbayev's fine words and the not-so-fine deeds he has done in Kazakhstan to become its apparent dictator. This is what the Congress of World and Traditional Religions has to say about Nazarbayev, from their own written tenets. We welcome the outcome of the United Nations Religions for Peace High-Level Dialogue, initiated by Kazakhstan and held on May 6, 2016, in New York under the auspices of the President of the 70th UN General Assembly, which was aimed at the implementation of the Plan of Action on Preventing Violent Extremism. We welcome the initiative of the President of the Republic of Kazakhstan, Nursultan Nazarbayev, to establish a global anti-terrorist coalition, network under the auspices of the United Nations and to adopt a UN comprehensive document on countering terrorism, in accordance with the provisions of the Global Counter-Terrorist Strategy and the UN Security Council resolutions. We urge the international community to support President of Kazakhstan Nursultan Nazarbayev's Manifesto the World. The 21st Century which proposes a global strategy of concerted and responsible actions by countries to eliminate the virus of wars and conflicts. We express particular concern regarding the threat of nuclear terrorism. We call on the international community to follow the example of Kazakhstan, which renounced the fourth largest nuclear arsenal and closed the Semipalatinsk nuclear test site 25 years ago, which set an example in building a secure future for the whole planet. We note the special role of the Congress of the Leaders of World and Traditional Religions, which has become an effective platform for global inter-religious dialogue. Key point, as you have now learned, Kazakhstan is certainly not a model country and Nazarbayev is certainly not a saint. So it makes you wonder why the UN favors Astana as a home and capital of a new one world religion and him as a perfect leader of the new world order? Nazarbayev and Francis didn't expect the trump card. The battle wages on between Nazbayev and Francis, but the stakes are now paltry. All that President Trump needed to do was talk about defunding or terminating UN funding or suggest that US membership in the UN might not be a good deal for us. Trump has taken the golden ring from the two evil emperors and the war for a one world religion is dissipating as the new world order stumbles and falls. The true nature of the United Nations is clear for all to see and President Donald Trump has called their bluff. U.S. support of CIA indoctrinated tyrants and dictators is over and the United States of America will now prosecute criminals, no matter how high a political position they hold or held. The tracks of Bush Sr. and Dick Cheney's rogue CIA are all over Eurasia and the time has come for all domestic terrorists and traitors to be prosecuted for their criminal activities. The larger connections to 911 become clear when the truth of Kazakhstan and Azerbaijan is unveiled.
We the people now demand that the perpetrators of 911 be exposed, all of them. We have laid out the case in our citizen intelligence report the CIA and the Deep State, a report that should have come from our elected officials to we the people many years ago. All you need to do, fellow Americans, is look over this thoroughly researched report and acquaint yourself with the material. Then forward a copy to your elected representatives and demand answers to everything. That's the news. Join us here every day. Be sure to subscribe and click the bell. See you next time. This is TBNN.